We need to live with an urgency, and urgency to do everything Jesus Christ has set out for us to do. Live with an urgency because you don't have the time to waste by not being who God called you to be. We don't have time to dabble outside of what we know we're here for. A pastor I know asked an older man on his deathbed what's one of the most sobering realities of life that comes to mind for you right now. The old man answered the brevity of it. It's short, it passes by quickly, and many people are hit with the reality that life has passed by very quickly. When it's too late. So hear me clearly. Time does not wait on you. It will never wait on you. God purposely gave you this one brief life, so make your time count. The number of days you have on this earth should produce some kind of fruit for God's purposes. You have lives to touch. You have unbelievers that you need to point to Christ. You have a call to serve. You have assignments to fulfill with a due date that you are not aware of. Let that not lead you to procrastination with your deeds. Let it instead lead you to labor, like the due date is today. Work with urgency. Serve with urgency. Love with urgency. Pray with an urgency. Seek God with an urgency. Every day really does count. Our lives will be judged one day by our Father in heaven. And I mean everything. Every deed we've done or not done in our precious time on this earth will be held in account before God. This is the knowledge we have now while there is still something to be done about it. So do something about it. Do all you can about it. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? At the end of it all, our works will be judged and tried by fire. They will be judged and tried by fire. Let's not breeze through that statement. When that statement was made by Paul in 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians knew exactly what it meant to be tried by fire. The city of Corinth had been run through and devoured by flames itself. Everything that could have possibly been consumed by the fire was consumed by it. The fire tried the city, leaving only the great marble standing while everything else was annihilated. This fire judged the city of Corinth in a definitive, irreversible way. In this same way, our works will be judged by fire. It will burn everything that can be burned, and only that which is deemed worthy by God will remain. So I'm saying that only what we do for Christ and in Christ will stand after the trial by fire. We have work to do. Little time to do it. We all know that no man knows the day or hour that Christ will return. At any moment, he could decide to snatch his church away. So what would each and every one of us have to show for our lives up to this moment? We've all heard the phrase, the last days since biblical times. A few of the New Testament letters include this phrase as the writers press their readers on toward greater acts in the name of the Lord. They did not know whether the Lord would return very soon or not. But they knew it was important to stress that we are living in the last days in God's eyes. Maybe this is because every generation needs to have a sense of urgency in their actions. Perhaps the firm last days isn't necessarily a definitive countdown of the exact number of days until Christ returns. Perhaps the firm the last days is simply another way of saying live with urgency because life is short. Every generation needs to know that it could in fact be the last days during their lifetime. Every generation needs to know that they have an important role in God's plan for the kingdom. We're all contributors in the body of Christ. We're all important. We're serving the kingdom of God. And so we should be. We have to be effective members in the body of Christ. Now more than ever, there needs to be a sense of urgency in our hearts that leads to action. Live every day as if the return of Christ is during your lifetime. He is coming back. Be prepared. Have you ever heard someone say, life happens or it's just life? When speaking of a situation or circumstance that they have recently experienced, there are certainly many situations that occur which we can attribute to normal life when they happen. For example, it's probably safe to say that when a baby is crying because he or she is hungry or when a teenager fails a test, because they did not study, that is just life. We might also say life happens or something equivalent when someone loses a job or when they don't get the job. But have you ever thought that maybe some things we accredit as being just life might actually be something very different? Because it is not just about life at all. There are many instances or occurrences that happen in our natural life that are more of a spiritual issue than a natural one. Unfortunately, many people do not have the ability to understand the difference simply because 
they've never accepted the spiritual truth about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. In his letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul said, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. According to Paul, when we are living according to the desires and purposes of our carnal nature, we cannot accept the things of God. So the question is, how do we discern? How do we know when we are more directed to satisfy the things of the flesh instead of the things that pertain to God? And furthermore, how do we know when the circumstances we go through are just life happening? instead of a spiritual battle that we need to be warring against in the heavenlies? First of all, as a Christian, in order to discern whether we are more driven by the flesh, we must be willing to honestly answer some basic questions about ourselves. Do we spend more time thinking about what we want or how we want things to be, more than we spend time thinking about what God desires based on what He has said in His Word? Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Meaning seek the Lord first, put God first. Place him above everything else in your life and place him before anything else in your life. Carnal-minded people tend to only call on God when they are in need. Spiritually-minded people keep God in the forefront of everything they do, and they do not do anything without him. Another question to ask ourselves is, are we more concerned about our own personal needs more than we are concerned about the needs of other people? In his letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Carnally-minded people seem to always be more troubled about the issues they have rather than the problems or circumstances of other people. Spiritually-minded people understand that when they help the people around them through their difficulties, God will always make a way to get through the complications that arise in their own personal lives. There are many other questions that can be addressed to help us understand whether we are living in a carnal state or a spiritual one? Do we love God and people more than we love ourselves? Do we seek pleasure more than we seek God? Are we content with where we are and with what we have? Or do we always want more? Are we always willing to forgive other people when they do things that hurt us? Do we spend time with God in prayer for others, even those we believe to be our enemies? The truth is, that we must first make sure we are living a life of spiritual maturity, denying our carnal nature. In order to address the second question that we asked previously, which is how do we know when the circumstances we go through are just life happening or a spiritual battle? As we learned earlier, we cannot receive the things of God without spiritual discernment, and we cannot have spiritual discernment if we are living as a natural man, giving in to the desires of our carnal flesh. The writers of Hebrews in chapter 5, verse 14, eloquently stated, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, it takes a lot of practice to become mature, but it takes maturity to be able to discern good from evil. There's no doubt that we live in a time in which it's very difficult to know whether what we face in day-to-day -day circumstances is just life happening or if it's something beyond this world that we need to address as spiritual warfare. Without the discernment of God working in our lives, we have absolutely no hope of recognizing the difference between just life and the spiritual attack of the enemy of our soul. The Bible teaches us that the devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but Jesus came to give us an abundant life. The Word also tells us to be sober-minded, be watchful. 
Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But James 4, 7 said, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In every area of our lives that the enemy may try and attack us spiritually, God has made a way of escape, but it does take discernment to know the difference between just life and spiritual battles. The carnal man has no hope of knowing the difference, but the person who walks with God will be given what he needs to both see the battle and win the battle because he is victorious and Jesus Christ. The Amplified Translation for Romans 10 verse 3 says, For not knowing about God's righteousness, which is based on faith, and seeking to establish their own righteousness based on works, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Consider the following question. Are you righteous in word? Are you righteous in thought? Are you righteous in your deeds and motives? To put it another way, do your words reflect Jesus Christ? Do your thoughts reflect Jesus Christ? Are your deeds and motives reflective of Jesus Christ? If you find that your answers to these questions are no, then it's time to repent and remove the hindrances. When we are correctly positioned in Christ as the righteousness of God, we can have the confidence to present our troubles to Him and await deliverance. No. I want you to also be aware that being in Christ and chasing righteousness that does not make you immune from troubles. Because the scripture says in Job 14 verse 1, man who is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. When I read this, it hits home. These troubles spoken of are the troubles that God is saying, bring to me and I will help you. These are the troubles that God is saying, bring to me and I will help deliver you as long as you're in your rightful standing. You will see the hand of God deliver you as long as you are in your rightful standing, as long as you are in Him, in Christ. You will see the hand of God reaching out and delivering you. If you ever felt unqualified, if you ever felt unworthy to be used by God, then you're in good company with so many other Bible greats. You see, Moses felt unworthy to lead the people of Israel. Peter felt unworthy to wash Jesus' feet. And when Paul set out to reach the Gentiles, he counted all his religious accomplishments as rubbish. The Bible makes it clear that it's not about our qualifications. It's about God's power working through us. Understand that God qualifies. The unqualified man looks at outward appearances, but God looks upon the heart. So today, if you think God's grace is out of reach, if you think you'll never be qualified enough, then this message is for you. I would like to tell you today that the Lord God will take you as you are. He'll take you with all your weaknesses. He'll take you with all your flaws, all your shortcomings and mistakes. Even at your lowest, God will still take you as you are. You see, He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It doesn't matter how broken or damaged or messed up you are. It doesn't matter what you've struggled with in the past or what you're going through right now. God's power is made perfect in your weakness. We can never measure up to God's standards, but in His mercy, Jesus came to live the perfect life that we could not, and He died so that we would have the joy of knowing the Lord forever. So when the world says you're not good enough, remember that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. God loves us just as He found us, but thankfully, he doesn't leave us there. He promises to fill us with His Holy Spirit. Through Him, we can become something far greater than we could ever be on our own. He has set us apart to accomplish great things in His kingdom. He will transform and renew you. He will mold you into a vessel He can use.